here's problem four off the final exam from fall 16 for math 111, another problem that is very common to find on final exams. It incorporates a lot of the chapter three ideas. The idea in the first problem, you use the rational root test or rational root theorem, depending on what book you're looking at, to list all the possible rational roots of this polynomial. So not all the roots, just the possible ones that happen to also be rational numbers. And to do that, you need to know the theorem, and the theorem tells you that rational roots will always be of the form p over q, where p is a factor of the constant term. So I need to know all the factors of the number three, which are just one and three. And q is a factor of the leading coefficient, um, because this is also a prime number, there's not a bunch of factors, just one and two are the only possibilities. So one of these numbers divided by one of these numbers, and it could be either plus or minus. So if I take the one divided by the one, I get plus or minus one. If I take the three divided by the one, I get plus or minus three. If I take the one divided by the two, I get plus or minus a half. And if I take the three divided by the two, I get plus or minus three halves. These are the possible rational roots. They're not all roots of this polynomial because there's eight numbers here and this polynomial has at most four rational roots has mo at most the sum of the multiplicities of the roots is exactly four so it has at most four roots um, at most four rational roots therefore so what i want to do is test until i find one of these that works but i don't want you just kind of searching blindly especially without a calculator so typically what i do is i tell you which one does work but then i want you to kind of prove to me that that does work what do you mean by it works well, one, which is on this list, positive one, is a root. And I want you to show me that. The way you show me that is you take one and you stick it into this function, put it into this machine, and make sure that zero comes out. If zero comes out, it's a root, because a root is synonymous with x-intercept if it's a real number. Um, and an x-intercept happens when the height equals zero. So see if the height is zero. Well, if I change all the x's into ones, I will get two plus one minus five minus one plus three. Does this net out to zero? Well, two plus one is three, plus three more is six, and negative five minus one is negative six, so sure enough, that does net out to zero. One is a root of this polynomial. The factor theorem tells me that if r is a root of my polynomial, then x minus r is a factor of that polynomial. So specifically in this case, because one is a root, x minus one must be a factor. If x minus one must be a factor, then I can use polynomial long division I can take x minus 1 and divide it into my original polynomial, which was 2x to the fourth, uh, plus x cubed, minus 5x squared, minus x, plus 3. And I can perform polynomial long division. And as I perform polynomial long division, I'll expect the remainder to be equal to 0. To perform polynomial long division, I need to get rid of this 2x to the fourth. And so I can do that if I put a 2x cubed up here. And then if I take that 2x cubed and multiply it by x minus 1, I get 2x to the 4th minus 2x cubed. And now I subtract. And the subtraction step is where a lot of people mess up. If you subtract these two numbers, it cancels out, which is good. But if I subtract these two numbers, be careful, you get positive 3x cubed. 1x cubed minus negative 2x cubed is the same as 1 plus 2 which is three. And then I bring down this negative five x squared. Now I repeat, if you wanna get rid of this three x cubed, you better put a three x squared up here because three x squared times x gives me exactly three x cubed. Three x squared times negative one gives me negative three x squared and I subtract again. These go away, negative five minus negative three is the same as negative five plus three, which is negative two x squared. And I'll bring down that negative x. Now I want to get rid of this negative 2x squared, so I'll throw a negative 2x up here. Negative 2x times x gives me negative 2x squared. Negative 2x times negative 1 gives me positive 2x, and I subtract. Again, this column goes away. Negative 1x minus 2 more x gives me negative 3x, and I bring down that positive 3. You want to get rid of this negative 3x? Better toss a negative 3 up here, because negative 3 times x gives me negative 3x. Negative 3 times negative 1 gives me positive 3. You subtract and everything goes away. I get no remainder. That's fantastic. That's exactly what I was hoping would happen. You can leave your answer like this, or you can say, now what I know that my polynomial f of x can be written as x minus 1 times 2 x cubed plus 3 x squared minus 2x minus 3. Part E says factor the quotient from part D. Factor this thing more. And it gives you a little hint, factor by grouping to obtain the final factored form of f. 
So let's maybe over here, I'll just say, let's factor 2x cubed plus 3x squared minus 2x minus 3. And then when I get the factored form of this, I can kind of tack on this x minus 1 and get my factored form. Uh, it says factor by grouping. So this is my first group. I look for their greatest common factor. It's x squared in this case. If I pull an x squared out from this first group, what I'm left with is 2x plus 3. That becomes my target. I want to now look at my second group and factor something out so that I'm left with the same target. I'm left with 2x plus 3 in the parentheses. Well, you can do that if you factor out a negative 1. If you factor out a negative 1 from this second group, you'd be left with 2x plus 3. And what you now have are two terms, and each of those terms have a 2x plus 3 in them. So you can factor out that 2x plus 3. Now this is gone, and this is gone. So all that's left behind is x squared minus 1. Uh, so what I get is that f of x is equal to x minus 1 times 2x plus 3 times x squared minus 1, which is how a lot of people left it. And I think I gave you full credit here as long as you get all the x-intercepts from this. But technically, you can go further here. Um, that's because this is a difference of squares. So x squared minus 1 factors. It factors as x plus 1 times x minus 1. If you got this far, you definitely got full credit. However, I'd make the point that this can be rewritten as x minus 1 squared times 2x plus 3 times x plus 1. You have 2 of, oh man. So that was really annoying. That program just crashed on me and everything that I did got erased. And I am certainly not going to go back and redo that whole thing. Um, but I think I left off here. I think I left off that we had x minus 1 times 2x plus 3 times x minus 1 times x plus 1. And I think I had mentioned that I'd probably give you full credit even if you just got to here. But technically, you could factor this further to get to here. And then there's no reason to leave it here because you have two of these x minus 1 factors. So you could write it as x minus 1 squared. But really, any of these three would be just fine by me. Um, and then you move on to part f, and it says determine the x-intercepts of f. Well, now that we have the factored form, that's pretty easy. Uh, x-intercepts happen when your function f of x equals 0. So to figure out when f of x equals 0, well, it'll equal 0 if x minus 1 squared equals 0. And that happens if x minus 1 equals 0, which happens when x equals 1. And it'll happen if 2x plus 3 equals 0. So that happens if 2x equals negative 3. In other words, x equals negative 3 halves. Uh, and finally, it'll happen if x plus 1 equals 0. In other words, if x equals negative 1. So I have x-intercepts at 1, negative 3 halves, and negative 1. This x-intercepts has, has a multiplicity of 2, which is relevant if you have to sketch a graph, which I do later on. Um, but for the purposes of part f, you didn't have to write anything. You just have to say it's got an x-intercept at 1. Finally, sketch a graph of f. Uh, I better make sure that I have all the right information because it all deleted copied my polynomial down here so that I'll have enough information to graph this guy. Uh, so let's see, looking at this guy, I know there's an x inter or a y-intercept at positive 3. If you should change all your x's into zeros, positive 3 would come out of this thing. So I got a y-intercept right here. And then I know I have x-intercepts at positive 1, so maybe right here, negative 1, right there, and negative 3 halves, which is the same as negative 1 and a half. So if this is negative 1 and this is negative 2, I guess that would be negative 3 halves. And what i got to draw is a graph that goes through these points. It has to bounce off at these points and then has to incorporate the correct end behavior. It bounces off here because the multiplicity of this root was 2. It goes right through here and here because the multiplicities of those roots are 1. Well, it turns out that I can do that. If I draw something that looks kind of like this. This is not a perfect sketch. It's a very approximate sketch of the graph. Uh, but it goes through these two points, this point, and it bounces off at this point, and that would get you full, uh, full credit, would be the correct answer. Note that I never even figured out the end behavior. I could figure out the end behavior. As x goes towards infinity, y goes towards infinity, it goes up on the right. And as x goes towards negative infinity, y goes towards positive infinity, it goes up on the left. But I didn't even have to. Because in this case, if you know the y-intercept and the multiplicity of the roots, you're kind of forced to go up on this side and up on this side. It has to cross at these points and then nowhere else. So there's no way this would kind of come back down here because it'd have to cross this axis. So you didn't even have to take the time to figure out the end behavior. Although if you wanted to, you would find that it has exactly the end behavior that I depicted here.